Okay, great. So uh, I'm Tim Sylvester, founder of Integrated Roadways, and we're the intersection of infrastructure and information technology. The long-term purpose of my company is to provide new funding for public works. We do that through alternative funding models, including public-private partnerships to leverage private financing and uh, new revenue streams through embedded services in the roadway itself. So that means things like wireless electric vehicle charging and navigation systems for driverless cars that can provide subscription-based services so that cities and departments of transportation can bring their infrastructure up to date and keep it up to date without new taxes or without tolls or new bonds. Uh, basically, this is a way to implement user fees so that roadways can be self-supporting. However, we build next generation infrastructure. It's not just roads and highways. Just like Ford now uses robots and, and automated production for the vast majority of their labor, that's what we can do over time through using factory built pavements. And that allows us to invest in industrial scale 3D printing. The next destination for infrastructure is space. Now the thing that holds us back economically, socially, politically from outer space is the extreme cost of access. When you're accessing outer space through individual rocket launches, you have a very limited capacity and the expense is extremely high. So our concept is to use revenue streams from commercializing factory built pavements and uh, monetizing driverless cars to support the development of a 3D printer that we can launch into outer space. So this 3D printer then would print essentially a structured carbon nanotube graphene ribbon. When I say structured, I mean that there will be other embedded systems to provide features within the ribbon. So the 3D printer prints a carbon fiber ribbon out of both of its sides as it's orbiting Earth in a geosynchronous orbit. As I mentioned, it prints out both sides, so it's a balanced system. It's not falling towards Earth, it's not falling away from Earth, it's just geostationary um, due to the, the, you know, the balance of its own weights. The printer will be continually resupplied by additional rocket launches to essentially replace the printer cartridges. As the ribbon grows long enough to reach Earth, we then create an anchor point on Earth to attach the ribbon to. Then we have the basics of a space elevator. Now that you have a very thin ribbon connecting you to outer space, you essentially send a crawler, as it's called, which is basically an elevator car, up the ribbon. And this crawler provides a larger 3D printer, one that's big enough that you couldn't economically launch it on a rocket. This printer starts the same process again, only it's printing a larger ribbon. And you continue this over and over until you have a ribbon large enough to carry commercial sized loads. So at this point, we've got an industrial scale 3D printer that has a three meter by one meter ribbon that extends from geosynchronous orbit to the Earth, and we can send full-size commercial cargo containers up this ribbon. And so what we do is we send up the components for a space station, and you build a space station around the 3D printer that printed the space elevator. So now you've got a space elevator attached to a space station, and you can start doing all kinds of stuff up there because a space elevator reduces the price of access to space so that it is comparable to shipping a traditional cargo load a comparable distance. And by the way, in order to power it, you can actually harness the voltage differential between planet Earth and outer space. That is where lightning comes from. That's where all of the charge potential from lightning comes from, is that voltage. So we can use that to actually power the crawlers. So now we have the ability to send up multiple full-size loads to this space station. Remember I mentioned the other ribbon extending out the other side. Well, think about whenever you're spinning a ball on a string. What happens when you let go of the string? The ball goes flying away. So what you do is you attach another one of these printers to that ribbon on the other side. And you program its release timing so that it gets flung towards the moon, or towards Mars, 
or towards any other planetary body in the solar system that you want inexpensive access to. And it flings it off the ribbon at such high acceleration that it reaches its target much faster than essentially starting from zero with traditional propulsion. So now you have a space elevator on Earth, one on Mars, one on the Moon, and uh, once these printers have actually printed their respective ribbons, then you send out a crew in a ship, you fling them off of the cable in the same way. And they go down and they attach the new space elevator on Mars or the Moon or wherever to the surface, and so now you have access to your other planets fairly inexpensively, and the transit between the two has been slashed because you're robbing orbital momentum from the planetary body in order to accelerate your craft. So instead of taking months to reach Mars, it now takes days or maybe weeks. Now we have what's called an intrasolar civilization. That means we have access to multiple planetary bodies in our solar system. So the next step is to develop our intrasolar economy. And we do that by flinging some miners towards the asteroid belt and they set up mining operations and you bring the raw materials home or you set up a, a processing plant out at the asteroid belt, maybe some, some automated factories to produce more mining systems and so on and so forth. So now we have an intrasolar civilization that's mining the asteroid belts. We can accomplish all of this within 20 years if we invest our resources properly. So the next thing to do is you bring all of these resources back from the asteroid belt and you create what's called a star dock. Okay, you build a ship in a dock. You build a starship in a star dock. So uh, you build a star dock on your space elevator platforms and you begin construction of the starships necessary for the 100-year starship project. In short, that is how you transition from an Earth-based civilization to an intrasolar civilization to an intersolar civilization, which means that you now are inhabiting multiple solar systems. All of this is fully achievable by, within my lifetime by simply making appropriate investments in the appropriate technologies. So first, we commercialize factory-built pavements, we monetize driverless cars, we use those investments for 3D printers that can build space elevators, use the space elevators to build an intrasolar civilization, use that to mine the asteroid belts, and acquire the resources necessary to build starships to access other solar systems to build an intersolar civilization. That's really how we guarantee humanity's future and ensure that a single cataclysmic event cannot wipe us out.